Okay, so you want to make some mead. Um, here are 10 things you need to know before you make your first mead. Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Um, I am a mead maker and a YouTuber and a, hopefully a mead educator at this point. And uh, I wanna to talk to you guys about some things that I wish I knew before I made a mead. And um, I'd heard about mead making, I heard about mead in general. Uh, I kind of threw my hat out there and just did it. And um, I learned some things and hopefully I can educate you on you know what those are. So I'm gonna introduce you to a couple ingredients, uh, things that will you know, our bare essentials for mead making. I'm also gonna tell you some uh, more in depth things, uh, hopefully to ease some worries you might have, but also to, uh, you know, just generally help you understand how mead making works. So let's start with the very, very basics. Before you even start making mead, you need to have something to sanitize. That is the beginning of all, it is the root of all evil, it is also the way to avoid all evil. Uh, what I use, there are multiple things you can use, but this is Star San, and it is a, a cleaning solution, it is a, um, a sterilizer, sanitation method um, for cleaning glassware and cleaning everything I use, basically. So you can get this whole thing um, at your local brew shop, Amazon. I'll make sure and put all the links down below um, to what I'm talking about. You can also find it on my um, uh, website, which is manmademead.com, Amazon links. Everything I use for mead making is in that store. So uh, you can go check that out and that will help you there. But here's a little pro tip, ready? I wish I knew this. Star sand, I knew sanitizing, very important. I didn't learn until about a year in that you can take and get distilled water, not just regular water, distilled water, mix it with your star sand, put it in a, a spray bottle, and of course, you know, stir it up. This right here will last for roughly a month. You can get many, many uses out of this. A lot of people will sanitize by getting a bucket, get some water, and then basically have a one use version of their star sand. And so they're just going through this all the time. Pro tip number one, get a water bottle, or get a spray bottle, get some still, distilled water, get star sand, put it in there, you can use it for a month, then you gotta change it out. So that's uh, first thing, okay? Another thing you're gonna need, when you make mead, and I wish I'd known this because I did not take um, some important measurements before I started making my first meads. This is called a hydrometer, and a hydrometer is a tool used to measure the gravity, specific gravity of a mead, which is how you figure out your uh, alcohol by volume. So uh, without this thing, you are kind of out of luck. You have no idea. Before you start making, well, before your mead starts fermenting, really, you need to take a hydrometer like this, put it into that mead, and it'll float to where the gravity of the mead is. So let's say, for example, you know, mine floated up to one. It says here, it measures by one point, whatever, zero, 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 uh, one point, this thing landed at 1.060. I can look at that and I can know, oh hey, that means that I have roughly, ooh, that is about 8% ABV. Alongside that, um, you can do this at the end after it finishes fermenting to check if all your gravity is gone. Um, it's a really good tool to know what your ABV of your meat is. You can also use, once you figure out the gravity, you can get online, there's some calculators to find out um, how, you know, what your possible ABV is. So uh, this you have to have. You cannot live as a mead maker, really as a brewer without a hydrometer. So make sure you take care of that. Uh, next thing, I wish I had learned this earlier on. I was watching some of my videos from when I first started mead making. It took me a long time to realize, hey, you need to make sure and elevate your liquid when you're moving it over. So let's say that I'm moving one of my carboys, which was up here, and I'm moving it into this thing right here. If I am just racking from this to here, it takes longer because gravity. Gravity is stupid and it kind of dictates our life. So what you need to do is elevate your liquid up so that when you rack using a racking cane and a and tubing, um, or sorry, auto siphon, auto siphon, you, uh, it goes down and gravity helps you. That's the easy way to move faster with that. So make sure you're elevating what you're moving out of and then the thing you're moving into is lower. That helps. Uh, so number three, synthetic corks. You racked your thing over, you put it in your bottles. I am a huge fan of synthetic corks. These things right here. 
they are exactly what they what I say they are or you know what they are in general and that is um, they're not real like cork material they are fake cork material however they stay good for eternity basically whereas real corks um, if you do not store them correctly you might run into the issue that the cork does dries out air gets into the liquid it goes bad synthetic corks you can store straight up like this they don't have to be hydrated so I like using them um, they might cost you a couple pennies more per cork but still it's worth worth it in my opinion um, and again in my store um, down below go check it out if you want to get some synthetic corks uh, now we get to the more nitty-gritty stuff okay uh, number five I think I'm number five Yes, number five, your yeast, whatever you put in there, um, they're not gonna activate immediately. When you put them in, you have to wait and see probably a good uh, 12 to 24 hours or sometimes even 12 to 36 hours before your yeast will start to um, come alive. And there are lots of methods by which you can put your yeast in. You can sprinkle them on top of your mead. Um, that's one method, you can rehydrate them. Most packets say to put in, you know, 75 degree water, 80 degree water, whatever, put your yeast in, they rehydrate, then put them in. Um, there are lots of different ways, not gonna get into that. Uh, your yeast will just not activate immediately. So if you are, you're making your first mead and you're going, oh my gosh, it's been 12 hours, there's no bubbling, what, what's happening? It's cool. They're probably just waking up. They're probably just getting used to the sugar content. Um, and that's all right, that just takes some time. If they're not bubbling within, I would say 48 to 72 hours, you might have an issue, um, in which case, you know, comment down below. Tell me if you have that issue. But also, uh, the, there's just a bunch of different problems that could be there, so I can't specify. They just don't activate immediately. Yeast sometimes just take time. That's fair. Okay? Um, I didn't realize that before, too, so I was very antsy when I first made my first few meads. I was watching it, like watching paint dry, going, why is this not happening? And in reality, it was just, it just hadn't happened yet. So, uh, next thing we have, uh, yeast, speaking of yeast, they have um, like a cap. Most yeast have an alcohol by volume cap. So let's say you've made your mead and I'm gonna use, I use a lot of Lavin products. So I'll use this for example, I put my hydrometer in, okay? And I, uh, let's see, I got all the way up to 1.120, which is about 15.5%. If I'm using a yeast that can only go up to 14% ABV, those yeast will reach 14% and then they will stop because they, have, they can't go any further. They're, that's their cap. So you have to factor that into your mead making. Some people, you can use it for good, you can use it for evil. Let's say you wanted to have a really, really sweet mead, um, then you're probably gonna have you know, a higher ABV and a lower ABV yeast. You can use that, again, to your advantage to create a sweeter mead, to create whatever you're trying to do. Um, but it just, it's all about planning and yeast and really in general mead making is about planning. But uh, your yeast, you just have caps. If you want to know about your specific yeast that has and what their cap is, uh, go check it out. Look it up online. There's lots of resources in that manner. So after that, let's say you've pitched your yeast. You've got that all figured out. You know your cap of your yeast. The best thing you can do to help your mead and your yeast in general is to provide them with um, a nutrient. So yeast nutrient and yeast energizer are two like stimulants for mead making. And a lot of people um, uh, don't know about them and it, it's just, you can survive without them. However, to best boost your mead's capability or yeast capability, you, you can use them. So what yeast nutrient is, it's just like food for your yeast. So as they're chewing through their process and they're fermenting, they need energy, just like we need energy. Like on a long run, you probably gotta eat a couple granola bars in order to get your way through a 10 mile run. So same thing with the yeast. The yeast energizer um, does that, gives them food. Sorry, the yeast nutrient does that. The yeast energizer is also kinda like that. Um, I equate it to like electrolytes for us. It is just a way to boost our uh, electrolytes boost our, our speed for a little bit and keeps us going. That's also very important. The combination of the two will most always give you a very successful meat. So if you're trying, struggling to make mead and you're going, man, I just can't, it's not getting going. Maybe you need to add some yeast, nutrient, and energizer. And there's lots of places to get them. Again, my store, you can find that below. Your lo local brew shop, go check it out there. Um, you, 
I would just absolutely be doing that. Um, on the other end of that, before I move on, there's a couple ways. There's two ways you can introduce your uh, your yeast nutrient and energizer. One is to just dump it all in at once, um, and that's just like Thanksgiving meal. You know, go for it. Good luck, and then you just feast on it for for the whole duration of a week, whatever. Uh, the other way is to step feed, or what we call a staggered nutrient um, introduction and schedule, which is where you take the bulk all of your Thanksgiving dinner and you basically meal plan, so for your yeast. So you are giving them on day zero a quarter of the meal plan of the yeast energizer nutrient mixture. On day two, same thing. On day four, same thing. On day six, same thing. And you're just feeding them over time. Um, that's a better method. It is more successful often. It just requires more effort. You have to really watch and make sure that you are uh, giving them food on time. So uh, I would prefer doing that. I often will just throw all my stuff in though. Okay, uh, after that, now we get even further. Um, when you make a mead, it, like anything you do, you gotta put quality ingredients in. If you are like using the pond water that you got from outside and you know some random yeast that comes off an apple and blah, 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 you're probably gonna make a pretty weird mead. Uh, that's why we, we have to sanitize things to get rid of bad bacteria. When you introduce a poor quality, um, even honey, or let's say poor quality water, you are likely introducing bad bacteria or like even sometimes tap water, depending on where you're at, can have uh, like chlorine and bad things in, the, things in it that don't ferment well. So I always use spring water. I just go buy gallons of water and then I use that and of course recycle because I use a lot of those bottles. But that keeps me from getting bad bacteria. That's clean, purified water. That's my first step. I also use high quality honey, nice honey. And you wanna use unpasteurized, unfiltered honey, generally, um, or lightly filtered at least. You don't wanna go like, some people go totally unfiltered and you end up with some extra bee parts and stuff in it. But uh, you just use high quality ingredients. Don't just grab the random things you get. You're probably not gonna end up with, your, with the best mead. Will you end up with a mead that's okay? Possibly. Have people made meads with really low quality ingredients? Absolutely. I just don't recommend it. Um, it's a gallon of water, a dollar. That is like, if go spend a dollar on the water instead of just getting that out of your tap. You'd be surprised, there's a, there's a difference. Um, now, this, is, <laughs> this one's kind of funny to me just because uh, it, it's really true. When I first started, I had no idea um, I was dealing with so much science. Like I knew brewing was intricate and that there were things happening and you know, you have yeast and they're feeding and blah, blah, blah. There are so many levels to this that like even now as I mean make it, I think people who have been doing it for years and years still find out new things. We are constantly trying to figure out how yeast work and how they ferment best. Um, there's two sides of this argument. First of all, like it's science in that it's hard. You have to do some testing to figure out what yeast works best for what fruits, for what things like that. Thankfully, we've done a lot of research in this regard, and so a lot of people are pretty good about saying that um, the D47 is a good traditional mead, and the Lavin K1B116 is a great mead for mellow mells, and such and such. So you can use your resources in that way. Um, but you have to do some some digging to figure that out. The other side of the coin is when you figure that out, because it is science and science is fairly well proven, if you repeat the same um, ingredients, the same yeast, the same temperatures, you're probably going to end up with the, a very, very similar result. That's why breweries and uh, you know distilleries and wineries, all these places can make a, a very, very similar product every time. Maybe subtle differences, but very similar product because they have found the science of it. So uh, I've learned a lot about science because of brewing, and uh, that's pretty fun. Um, now we're getting to number nine and 10. Number nine, let's say you've made your mead and you're smelling it and you're going, uh, well, this is really, yeah, nine and 10. So uh, you're smelling your mead and you're going, oh man, that smells weird. Something's wrong, something smells sour, something smells um, off or sulfury or whatever. Uh, that is a likely sign that your yeast are stressed, which means that they've kind of freaked out and they're putting off some bad gases because they're going, hey man, we don't like this, something's wrong, which is okay. 
Um, what I've learned in my experience, because I had some of that when I first started brewing, I had some moments where I went, this does not smell good. Um, generally, those things go away. Those are what we call fusels. When your yeast are stressed, they create fusels. Fusels are just off flavors, off smells that the yeast put out because they are stressed. And they generally go away over time depending on how bad they are. Um, if it's so, so, so bad, there's a good chance that your mead has gone bad in general. If it's just a light smell, like, ooh, I smell a little sulfur, a little egg, something, um, that stuff does kind of go out over time. And that's just, you kind of have to be patient. But uh, watching out for that, again, making sure you take care of your yeast, nutrient, energizer, good temperatures, all that stuff, super, super important to make your mead well. If you don't, you'll probably make a mead that has some weird flavors to it. And power to you if you want to do that, that's fine. On the other side of that coin, um, a yeast smell, this is number 10, yeast smell is normal. Let's say I'm smelling my mead again, and especially if it's a fresh mead, just finished fermentation, you're probably going to smell some yeast. And that's because they're still active. They're like dying out, well they're falling asleep actively generally. So they're still floating around and uh, you're gonna get that smell, you're gonna get that taste. That goes away. As everything starts to settle, um, you will notice that the, those flavors go away. And uh, I didn't add this in number this list, but my last little thing is, when you are uh, racking your mead over, I would just let it sit for a while until you see it start to clear up some. And uh, some meads like to clear up quickly, others don't. But uh, the whole point of racking is to get it off of bad sediment, bad like stuff at the bottom trub or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's also to generally help it clear and uh, so you can do that. So to end all this, let me say this, there's no perfect mead. There's just not. And I understand you might have a commercial mead that you love and that's awesome. Mead making is so much about opinions and um, I think you know some of my stuff today has been opinions and I'm sorry if you don't agree, um, this, just, this is my opinion, but there's no perfect mead. We will, you might like this mead, you give it to your friend, they don't like it. Therefore, that mead is not perfect. And you can only make the perfect mead for yourself. So I don't mean that to, to send you away from this and go, hey, I don't wanna make mead because I can't make the perfect mead. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you make mead, you need to make it for yourself, something that you really like. And, then continue to get better at it in general and make even more of what you like. Share it with your friends from that point. If they like stuff too, that's awesome. But your perfect, the perfect mead is the one that you make that you really like, not necessarily the one that, you know, random person likes. There are a thousand great meads out there. I don't want to say that they're not. I do want to emphasize that mead making is a little subjective in that manner. So go out, make your own meads. Make sure you're trying to make stuff for yourself. And you'd be surprised, generally, if it's good to you, most people might like it as well. We have a good palate. Most of us have a good palate. Uh, use your friends as judgment too. So, these are all a bunch of things I wish I'd learned in the beginning. And it's taken me some years to figure it out, and that's why I want to share this with you guys. Uh, I would love to hear what you have to think, because, you know, I, uh, again, this is subjective. This is an opinion. And you might not agree with something I said, and that's okay. Uh, I just want to hear what you guys have to say, and I also want to um, just talk to you in general. Um, it's really nice to get to do that. Uh, if you like this video, make sure you like it, hit subscribe. If you want to go check out the links, there's that store link down below. You can find everything I've talked about today, um, and as far as equipment, amongst other things. And then if you want to support the uh, uh, channel, you can, of course, subscribe, but also there's a bunch of links to like Patreon and various things. But I uh, hope you've enjoyed. hope you guys have a great day, and go make some mead and uh, let me know how it goes. So with that, have a great day, and uh, cheers.